Hi, I'm very excited to be here today to tell you about a technology we've developed that allows us to use the cold of space itself to make more sustainable cooling possible here on our warming planet. Our story is not only that of a technology on its path from lab conception to commercialization, but it's also a story of scientific innovation that can yield unexpected insights and solutions for pressing aspects of the climate and energy challenge we face this century. And really, cooling is a central part of that challenge. Today, 17% of the electricity we use worldwide is for cooling. This goes all the way from your typical residential air conditioning and refrigeration system to the supermarket and cold storage facilities, refrigeration systems, and data center cooling systems that keep our servers operational, and even the power plant scale cooling systems that fundamentally enable thermoelectric power generation. Collectively, these represent an enormous economic opportunity simply because we spend a lot of money on electricity for these systems. Uh, there's also a lot of capital equipment associated with generating cooling as well. But from a climate change point of view, what's worrisome is today they represent about 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So this is both due to indirect emissions from the power plants that generate uh, the power for these cooling systems and also direct emissions. This comes from leakage of refrigerants that are uh, in these systems and they can actually trap far more heat per unit mass than carbon dioxide alone. There's another aspect uh, of cooling's environmental impact that isn't thought of often and that's water use. Hundreds of trillions of gallons of useful and scarce fresh water is used in cooling towers that are present in medium to large scale facilities everywhere. Now, while all of this is worrisome today, the thing that keeps me up at night is that energy use for cooling is expected to grow tenfold by the year 2050, and it's primarily going to be driven by the developing world. Now, it's not really fair for those of us here who have benefited from cooling's uh, uh, various uh, aspects, whether that's keeping our homes and rooms cool and also the benefits of a consistent food supply, uh, to ask people that live in Mumbai or Lagos not to benefit from these technologies. So how do we deal with this challenge? Well, by training and by background, I'm a scientist who was focused on optics and thinking very much about how new materials can allow us to manipulate light and heat in unexpected ways. And I was very drawn to this old idea that I'd like to tell you about right now that's called radiative cooling or sky cooling. And to introduce you to this concept, I'd like to show you this picture. So these, this is one example of a building known as an ice house. You find a lot of them scattered, mostly ruins, uh, throughout Iran and uh, the rest of the Middle East and North Africa as well. And what these buildings allowed people to do back then before the advent of electricity and also uh, conventional cooling systems was make ice without any electrical input. So what they do is they would actually put in uh, water in that flat surface right there, looks like a pool, uh, usually pour it in in the late evening, early night hours, and at night it would freeze and you'd have ice and you could then store it for use through the rest of the year. Now what's really interesting here is that in most of these places, it actually never got to freezing. So the air temperature itself was usually well above freezing, but they were able to entirely passively get this below the freezing point. Now how did they do that without any electricity? As crazy as it sounds, the reason this is possible is what's outside our planet is the coldest thing out there, the cold of space itself. Now this sounds a bit like science fiction, so let me actually assure you it's all science, and this actually works in a very fundamental physical way. So all objects, including you and I, and that pool I showed you in that Iranian ice house, send their heat out as infrared thermal radiation. If you've ever seen a thermal imaging camera, it's what it's picking up. So the, that pool or the surface of the Earth more generally sends this heat out. Now some of this is trapped. That's the greenhouse effect that you're all quite familiar with. But what's interesting is that some of this heat effectively escapes. And what that allows uh, us to do, and for example that pool of water to do, is freeze because it's actually rejecting some of its heat and go below the surrounding air temperature. This is a completely natural phenomenon that's known as radiative cooling or sky cooling, and you can convince yourself of it by taking uh, an infrared temperature gun that you might be able to pick up at Home Depot and pointing it up at the sky. If you do that today, you will actually see that the sky's effective temperature is much colder than our immediate surroundings. 
Other ways you might have actually encountered this uh, is if you've ever seen frost warnings and frost form on the ground, even though the air temperature itself is much warmer uh, than freezing. So this is an interesting idea. People have sort of danced around it for decades, and it was a topic of interest in the building efficiency world, beginning in the 60s uh, and going through the 80s and 90s. But it never, never really emerged as a major uh, technology that had an impact, both in terms of building efficiency and in terms of cooling. And why is that? Well, uh, and this is kind of funny for those of us that think of renewables, the problem here is actually the sun. So we need cooling most when it's hottest outside, and that's during the middle of the day. And it's precisely at those times of day that if you're outside facing the sky as you need to to achieve this cooling effect, you'll see the sun. And for most natural materials, the sun will completely counteract this cooling effect. So it's normally never seen in a natural kind of way. So when we began approaching this as scientists at Stanford, our perspective was one of researchers in optics, and we realized we could create essentially artificial materials, optical films that could see, do one thing when they saw sunlight, which is not absorb it, and at the same time radiate that heat out in parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can't see. And when you do that, it'll stay 20, 30, even up to 60 degrees colder than the air temperature, even if the sun is shining on it. So what we have then is a completely non-evaporative, no electricity needed way of getting below the air temperature, essentially free cooling. And what we've done since then is start a company, SkyCool Systems, that's building these panels as our first product. What these panels do is they cool fluids using these optical films. And in an analogy to a solar hot water heater, we cool water with these panels. This is backed by years of research that my team has done, uh, originally at Stanford and also at, at our company now. And our vision for this really is to be able to plug into today's conventional cooling systems. Now, typically, they have a cold side and a hot side. So the cold side of uh, a cooling system might be the, cold, the inside of your fridge. But to work, they also need a hot side. It's where they reject heat to actually deliver the cooling inside the box. Our vision for our technology is to be able to add our panels as a component of every cooling system on that hot side, and in doing so, reduce their energy usage for cooling. So this is actually a picture of our current field trial in Davis, California. Uh, and this is an operation with commercial scale refrigeration and air conditioning systems. Our value propositions to our customer are quite simply that we save electricity, typically about 10 to 20 percent, but we can do that throughout the day and throughout the year. It's also fundamentally uh, non-evaporative, meaning it uses absolutely no water, which is a, a big deal for these cooling systems. And what makes us very excited is that it can be a simple add-on to today's cooling systems and deliver value to customers in the near term. This, isn't just me. this technology isn't just me. We've had an impressive team that we've built around it um, that began working on it as researchers and then spun it out as a company. And this was all possible because we were funded by really a foundational grants from the Department of Energy's ARPA-E agency, as well as the National Science Foundation and the Tomcat Center at Stanford, which is funded by Tom Steyer. Uh, since we're in Silicon Valley, we've also, as a startup, benefited from a very healthy and generous ecosystem that has provided a, us a lot of feedback and insight on taking this technology to market. Our next steps are to deploy this technology in, first, in our first major commercial pilots, both in the commercial refrigeration space, so think supermarkets, cold storage facilities, as well as data centers. And really, from there, our vision is to take this technology and have it become a ubiquitous component of cooling systems everywhere. And we see opportunities everywhere, all the way from the residential scale up to the large industrial scale. I'd like to conclude by just reflecting on our own journey here and seeing that there are still opportunities out there that many of us may not have realized, and even resources that we may not have thought of as resources. I think we're just beginning the journey from a fundamental scientific point of view of thinking about the coldness of space itself as an energy resource. And I'm really excited to see where this all takes us. Thank you very much for your time.